you will, go ahead and open your Bible now to the book of Proverbs, to chapter 29. We're going to take the last verse of chapter 29, and then we'll start into chapter 30 this morning. And I encourage you to read along with us, and if you've got any comments, feel free to share those comments with the class. Solomon writes, An unjust man is an abomination to the righteous, and he who is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. Now, notice as Solomon talks about here, an unjust man, and then an upright man, and then he talks about to the righteous and to the wicked. And both of them are considered to be an abomination. Uh, it depends on your perspective. Uh, what does it mean an unjust man is an abomination to the righteous? Detestable. You look at a person's life and it disgusts you. How many of you look at what is being practiced in our world today? Maybe, for instance, I see these people waving signs which talk about wanting to uh, have abortions. Does that not disgust you and does it not make you feel awful to see that people are pressuring people to kill babies? Or maybe you see someone else who's promoting uh, such immorality as the, uh, this you know, homosexual movement that's being pushed and then the transsexual movement. Well, if I, there are several passages in Scripture which I think uh, emphasize this. Psalm 139, verse 21 says, do, not, do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? Uh, we often will say we have to love the sinner, and that is true, but we definitely do not love the sin nor the way the person is committing the sin. Uh, Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 8 says, I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. And so you have both sides that have a detest for one another. So you have the unjust man is an abomination to the righteous. He sees that lifestyle, and it disgusts him. But notice the way Solomon puts it. Then he says, and he who is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. Uh, how do right, unrighteous people look at those who are trying to do what's right? Same way. Um, I think about in 1 Kings chapter 22, you remember King Ahab and King Jehoshaphat, and it's, they're going to say, are we going to go out and go to war or not? And King Jehoshaphat said, well, is there not someone here we can inquire of the Lord and find out what God would want us to do? And it's the king of Israel responded by saying, there's still one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. Why did he hate him? Because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Uh, I think there is that tension that exists. Uh, between the righteous and the wicked. And uh, I think that re that's a real thing. People want to minimize it, but it's real of how people, uh, and we live in a world today, it seems like that there's the heightening of the more wicked and then people trying to be more righteous, and that conflict just becomes greater and greater almost every day. Oh, yes. Uh, people are willing to, to do violence to one another because of it. Let's go to chapter 30 now, verse 1. I will tell you, of the whole book of Proverbs, this has been the toughest verse for me. And you can say, well, why is that so tough? The words of Agur, the son of Jacob, his utterance, this man declared to Ithiel, to Ithiel and uncle. And you say, what's tough about that verse? Well, first of all, who is Agur? 
Well, there's a couple of alternatives, maybe more than a couple, but there's at least the first. Um, pseudonyms. Do y'all know what a pseudonym is? Right under a different name. And uh, does is Solomon's name only been Solomon in the Bible? Well, y'all th you think so? Well, let's go to... Uh, uh, First Kings, uh, no, no, let's not go to First Kings. Um, yeah, let's go to Second um, Samuel, chapter twelve. Second Samuel, chapter twelve, in verses twenty-four and twenty-five. Second Samuel, chapter twelve, verses twenty-four and twenty-five. What did Nathan? Call Solomon. What is it, Marty? Jedediah. So if you called Solomon Jedediah, would you be correct? Yes. Um, and sometimes names have different meanings, and that's the reason why it's possible that uh, this is Solomon writing under another name. Uh, that's not the prevailing opinion of most of the scholars, but that is at least an option. The other option would be that Agur was one of the wise men. Now, if you will turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 4. 1 Kings chapter 4. Look at verses 30 and 31. 1 Kings 4, 30 and 31. Thus Solomon excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men than Ethan the Ezrahite, Heman, Calcal, and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. Were there people who were considered to be exceptionally wise that Solomon was compared to? Yes, there were. So is it possible that he's one of these wise men of the East? Well, that's certainly possible that he was. Uh, because this is also going to apply when we get to chapter 31 and we start talking about King Lemuel. Now, um, so the first thing you have in this is who is Agur? Is he Solomon writing under another name or is this uh, another person who's among the wise? I will tell you, all week long, I have been going back and forth. Uh, at one point, I'll think, this has got to be Solomon. When you read what's written afterwards, some of it sounds so much like what Solomon has said, I think, that's got to be Solomon. And then the next minute, I'll read and I'll say, no, that doesn't sound like Solomon. And uh, so, I'll tell you, my opinion is right now, I don't know. So, if that's, that's good enough for everybody, I don't know. But it really doesn't matter. But I will tell you that uh, that was the first thing. The second thing is the word his utterance. And if you're reading the original King James, prophecy. And uh, some translations use the word revelation. Some will use the word oracle. What this means is this is an inspired message. This is a message that God gave him. That's the reason why it's an utterance. It's a prophecy. It's a message from God. So whether or not Agur is Solomon writing under another name or whether it is uh, one of the wise men like these other that were listed in 1 Kings 4, it really doesn't matter because this is an inspired message. If it's inspired of God, does it matter who the human penman was? Not at all. So I would suggest that. The third thing, this man declared to Ithiel, to Ithiel and Uncle. And when you read that, what does that mean to you about those guys' names? Anybody ever heard of Ithiel and Uncle? Ithiel's mentioned in one other passage in the book of Nehemiah, but it would certainly not be the same one. And uncle is not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. Neither is Jacob and neither is Agur. So if these names are proper names, then uh, we don't know who they are. We don't know anything about them. 
but there is a possibility that these are not proper names, that they are descriptions. For instance, the word ethyl uh, is a word that means I am weary. I'm weary. And uh, the last part, the E-L, it's I am weary, O God. Then the word uckle means uh, that I am worn out. I'm exhausted. So if you translated this, this man declared, I am worn out, O God. I am worn out. Or I'm weary, O God. I'm weary, O God. I'm worn out. And that's the way the ESV translates it. And that's, uh, and you say, well, that may actually fit more with the context because of what he's going to say in verses 2 and following. So when you get to the bottom line, it doesn't matter who it is because whether it is Solomon or Agur is a different person, that really doesn't matter. What does matter is the fact that this is an utterance from God. This is an inspired message from God. And I would favor the idea that maybe these are not proper names, that what he's talking about is, I'm worn out, I'm exhausted, I'm weary. Well, why am I exhausted? Why am I weary? Well, that's where we're going to pick up verses 2 through 4. Surely I am more stupid, original King James, I'm more brutish than any man, and do not have the understanding of a man. I neither learn wisdom nor have knowledge of the Holy One. Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in his garment? Who has established the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name, if you know? Now, um, going back to verse 2 here, if this person is saying, I am weary, I am weary, I am worn out, this makes good sense of him saying, I'm more stupid, I'm more brutish than any man. What does that word mean? What does the word brutish mean as well? I think y'all know what stupid means, don't you? Yeah, it's, it's an animal-like characteristic, and that's the reason why the King James used the word brutish. Uh, yeah, the brute beast. Uh, we're going to actually look at some passages. Let's go to Psalm 73. 73, and let's look at verse 22. This is, a, to me, such a really valuable passage to appreciate why this would be said. In Psalm 73, it begins with this um, idea I almost fell because when I saw the prosperity of the wicked and I saw that the wicked didn't have all the difficulties that the righteous people do and the righteous people have difficulties that they go through every day. And then he comes to the point and he says, you know, when I tried to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God and then I understood their latter end. In other words, he's trying to look at the way world works and he says, you know, everything just to me appears to go toward the bad people rather than toward the good people. And he said, but then I saw their latter end, and I saw that God does right the wrongs. Well, if you look with me at verse 22, I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. You see that word beast there? That's, that's the idea. I was like an animal. Uh, you know, when Jesus talked about you don't cast your pearls before swine. Why would uh, you not cast your pearls before swine? They don't understand that pearls have any value. If it's not edible, they don't care. And uh, an animal has no real understanding of how things work together. And so in Psalm 73, 22, He's saying, I was just like a brute beast. I didn't understand these things. I was ignorant. I was foolish. I was only looking at superficial things. Well, now if I go back to Psalm, or Proverbs 30, verse 2, surely I am more stupid, 
for I'm more brutish than any man and do not have the understanding of a man. Do you ever feel like sometimes you are so ignorant and so stupid of decisions you've made because you didn't think about what you were doing before you did it? All the time. I think most of us, Matthew. Now, grasping for wind, that's what I was going to say. When we get to the next verse, I was going to talk about, you know, uh, he, he's really trying to say, when you look at life, Solomon said, I tried everything. When I did, I found out it wasn't worth anything. Until I drew the final conclusion is to fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. Uh, but let's go on now. Let's look at verse 2. I neither learn wisdom nor have knowledge of the Holy One. There's two things here. I've neither learned wisdom. That's what makes me want to think, maybe this is not Solomon because he does talk about wisdom so much. But is it possible that Solomon could say, I, I thought I knew what wisdom was, but I didn't, sure didn't live like it. Do you think there's a time in Solomon's life when he could kick himself and say, for all the wisdom that God gave me, I didn't live it very well? You know, look at all those wives that he had married, 1 Kings chapter 11. So there's... Within this, I think, a, a valuable lesson, but the latter part of this is, or the knowledge of the Holy One of, he's talking about God. I have not really appreciated God for being who he is, and I really don't even understand. It's like there's a gap between here's who God is and here's how much I understand of him. Do you feel that same sort of difficulty in your life? Say, here's God, and here's what the Bible says about him, and here's how much I know, the great gulf between them. Look the way he puts it. Who has ascended into heaven, or who descended? Well, that, first of all, just eliminates all of us because of none of us have been there. He said, who has gathered the wind in his fist? That sounds exactly like what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, where he talks about all vanity of vanities, all is vanity and grasping or striving after wind. How many of us are able to grab the wind in our hand? None of us are. And then he asks the question, who has bounded the waters in his garment? Uh, I don't know if any of y'all have ever tried to, you can carry uh, solids in your garment, but how many of you ever tried to carry water? Doesn't work too well, does it? And it says, who established the ends of all the earth, or all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son name, if you know? Now, that really reminds me of the book of Job, but for just a few moments, let me step back and view these three verses as a whole. What he is saying is, is that man by himself is not a very good judge of what's right and wrong. In fact, I can't even really attain to the knowledge of what God has. In Jeremiah 10, verse 23, he says, O Lord, I know the way of man. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. In the context of Jeremiah chapter 10, he's talking about people who had just chose to do whatever they wanted to, and he said, I look at man, if you turn man loose, what does man do by himself? He messes up. I think the United States is a really good experiment of what would happen when people no longer have the Word of God as their center. When you have the movements of the 50s and 60s to try to take God out of the classroom, prayers out of the classroom, God's Word out of society, now we have a generation that has been raised, reared, that does not know much about God. And when you have a generation that doesn't know much about God, what kind of society do you end up with? A godless society. And the behavior is reflecting that. We go to Isaiah 6 and verse 5. Isaiah says, Woe to me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He's Isaiah saying, I, I'm just so undone because I am not a man worthy of this. Um, 
But admitting that you know very little of God and being humble enough to listen to God, I think, is very, very important. Uh, there's so many passages in Job. Let me just refer you to a few of these. The first one is found in Job chapter 11, verses 7 through 9, where he says, Can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Now, what he's, this is actually Zophar speaking in this passage, but it's true what he says. Man is incapable of understanding everything about God. Uh, did Job know everything that was going on in the background when he was suffering so badly? No, he didn't. And sometimes man has to step back and say, you know, God's in charge of this world. He knows what he's doing. I don't know what I'm doing. But the passage that draws my attention the most is found in the book of Job. And turn with me to Job chapter 38 for just a moment. Job chapter 38. Because the questions here in verse 4 make me think of what God asked Job in Job 38. And I'm just, it's really the whole chapter, but I'm just going to go through a few of these verses. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Stop. Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Job, what do you know? Well, what's the best thing to do if you don't know what to say? <laughs> don't say anything. So here's what he does. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? Who, when I made the clouds its garments and thick darkness a swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors, when I said, this far you may come but no farther, and here your proud ways must stop, have you commanded the morning since your days began and the cause of the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It takes on form like clay under seal and stands out like the garment." From the wicked their light is withheld and upright, upraised arm is broken. Have you entered the springs of the sea? Or have you walked the search of the depths? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? Now I'm going to stop there because it just goes on and on and on. What did Job have to admit after God asked him all these questions? I don't know anything. I'm just ignorant. I don't understand how this world was made. I don't know how God did it all. I see it. I appreciate it. But I certainly don't understand it. Well, if I'm going back over here to Psalm 30 in verse 4, it looks like to me that that's exactly what either Agur or Solomon is saying here is the fact that when you start looking at God and you start appreciating how much he knows in comparison to how much I know, then I have to admit that there's so much that I don't understand. Now, here is the passage to me that's the kicker. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I guarantee some of you know this very well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Trust not in your own understanding. Solomon would say, 
Wisdom is great. Wisdom is to be attained. Wisdom is to be solved. But how much of it do I have apart from God? If you don't know God's word, how much understanding do you have? Not any. And uh, that is what is so important in this section is seeing ourselves for who we are and what we are. Now, that's going to lead me to verses 5 and 6. I don't mean to cut anybody off. Does anybody else have any comments on that? Yes. And, and it's, you're seeing yourself in relationship to God. And it's only when man puts himself in relationship to God that he does have that humility to say, God knows it all and I don't know anything. Well, that leads me to verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Now, uh, let's see if we can uh, open this up together. Every word of God is pure. That means God's word is completely 100% without mistake, without error, without any problems within it. Now, I'm going to go ahead and ask you, what happens if you mix something with something that's 100% pure? It's no longer pure. For whatever portion you add to it, then it becomes impure. How many of you know what is in rat poison? 98% of it is good grain food. 2% of it is warfarin, which is coumadin, uh, blood thinner. And what it does, the, the rats eat it, and they hemorrhage inside and die in your walls and leave a smell. But uh, what happens is most of it's good. What happens if you take every word of God that is pure and you mix in some human doctrine with it? It's no longer pure anymore, is it? And so what he's trying to do is say, here's where you ought to be placing your confidence, your trust. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. What's a shield? It's something you use to protect you. And, uh, you know, if you had a bulletproof shield and uh, you, you stand behind it, are you worried? No. But what if you put, have holes all in it? Then you start saying, well, some of it might protect me, but if I'm not careful, something's going to come through one of those holes and get me. If every... Word of God is pure, but I put something else in it that's not God's word. What am I doing? I'm putting holes in the shield, and it's not a good protector anymore. So, those who put their trust in Him are the kind of people who would say, I don't know anything, I know God knows it all, and that everything God tells me is true and right and pure and holy and complete and if I'll just put my trust in him that whatever it comes up, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but I know God's always right. Well, verse 6, do not add to his words. Well, that's something the Bible talks about a lot, isn't it? Uh, do you remember the warnings against tampering in the book of Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, do not add to his words. Uh, which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God. Chapter 12, verse 32, whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, he says, I testify to every man who uh, hears the words of the prophecies of this book. If anyone adds to the words... Uh, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of God, or the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. 
there are warnings against tampering with God's message, with God's words. And uh, so if I'm going to look at this, every word of God is pure. You know what 2 Timothy 3.16 says? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So uh, every part of God's Word is true. We can rely on it. It has been proved. It's been tested. And it is certainly what we need to live by. Any comments? Oh, well, let me, I didn't even get the last part of this. If you add to his words, he will do what? He'll rebuke you and you will be found what? A liar. I hear people contradict God's word all the time. What are they proving themselves to be? They're liars. And the God's word is pretty plain about that, about people who have denied that. Now let's get to verses 7 through 9, and that's probably, I don't know if we'll get through this, but hopefully we'll be able to. Two things I request of you, deprive me not before I die. Before we look at the two things, uh, notice the way he phrases this. I request of you. To me, verses 1 through 6 is the reason why he says, I request. What's the significance of the word request? It's asking. It's not demanding. We're not on an equal footing with God. We don't go to God and say, God, you need to give me this. We don't have that right to do that. We're not in that position to do that. Then he says, deprive me not before I die. I think most of us will read that and think, well, I'd like to have this sometimes before I die. But this is really saying, this is something I want in life. This is what I'm looking for in my life. Well, what are the two things? Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, Feed me for the food that is allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Now, he's talking about two things here. The first one is, remove falsehood and lies far from me. Now, why would he want to remove falsehood and lies? Tiring. I'd use another T word. Trust. What about tempting? You remember in the Garden of Eden, what did Satan do with Eve? He lied to her. And all he did was to take part of what God said and just add a one little three letter word. You will not surely die. And what he was doing here was putting a lie in front of a person, and if a person hears a lie, believes a lie, and obeys a lie, what will happen to them? You'll be lost. That's in fact, if you want to know the, the plan of salvation is, or the scheme of redemption in the Bible is, first of all, you have the devil telling a lie, you have Eve believing the lie, and then you have her obeying the lie. And you want to be saved, what do you have to do? You have to Believe the truth, you have to obey the truth. And uh, so you, you've got that same sort of uh, either truth or lie. He says, remove far from me lies and falsehoods. Now, um, to me, there's a lot in the Bible about temptation. You remember Jesus' prayer in Matthew 6, the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, from the evil one, from the devil. Uh, remove far from me falsehood and lies. He's saying, I don't want somebody to trick me. I don't want somebody to deceive me. I don't want somebody to lie to me. 
There's a passage, I think, useful in Matthew 24. Do you remember Matthew 24 is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem? And the Lord gives several things that would be taking place before the destruction of Jerusalem. And he said in verse 24 of chapter 24, For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Now here's a question I've got. Is it possible for members of the Lord's church to become deceived and get involved in something that's sinful and wrong? Yes. How did that happen? How does it happen? Somebody's got to lie to us. Somebody's got to tell us something that's false, and we believe it, and then we pick it up. And you say, well, I, I don't want that to happen. So what's the solution? Remove far from me lies and falsehoods. I think what he is asking here, whether it's Agur or Solomon again, is, Lord, I don't want to surround myself with people who are not going to tell me the truth. I've heard people say, well, you know, you can go to church there, but you've got to learn to pick the, the bad out, from, you know, pick the good out from the bad. Does that make sense? Because if you're constantly trying to decide whether somebody's telling you the truth or lying to you, pretty soon you're going to believe a lie. I don't want to sit and let someone teach me who's not going to tell me the truth. So give me neither falsehood or move falsehood and lies far from me. Now the second one is give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is allotted for me. Now I want to stop at this point. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Now well, why would that be so serious? Neither poverty nor riches. Okay, focus. He wants to be delivered from the extremes. Poverty, you don't have anything. Wealth, you have more than you need. Too little presents a person with the temptation to steal, as he's going to talk about, whereas too much causes you to be self-sufficient. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6 for just a moment. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we'll look at verses 8 and 9, and then we'll look at verse 17. Because what Paul says is exactly what is found here. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation and snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Food and clothing being content. I go back to Matthew chapter 6 when Jesus said, do not be anxious, or the uh, American, or King James says, take no thought. New American, or the New King James says, do not worry about what you will eat, what you'll drink, or what you'll put on. Is not the life more than food and the body more than clothing? In other words, is this all it's about? Is this what we have here of material things? What's the answer to that? Verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So the poverty of the riches, and so he says people who desire to be rich, can a poor man desire, desire to be rich? We tend to think that uh, this is only about rich people. I suggest to you verses uh, 6 through 8 is not about rich people, it's about poor people. Those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare because what they're doing is they're thinking that is the solution to all their problems, and it's not. Verse 17 goes on to say, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in the uncertainty of riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. 
So 1 Timothy chapter 6 gives us really both ends of the spectrum. And so he says, feed me with the food that is allotted for me. So Jesus doesn't use that phrase. He said, give us this day our daily bread. In other words, you and I are to uh, be thankful. And where did they learn that idea of daily bread? Manna in the wilderness. Learning to be thankful for what God gave them each and every day. And then verse 9 said, lest I be full and deny you. Rich people have a very difficult time because in their eyes, they don't need anything. And we would also add to that Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. And he would say, who is the Lord? I, you know, I don't need to know anything about God. Or he say, or lest I be poor and steal. Uh, the being poor and stealing, God is very uh, plain on the idea of stealing. Ephesians 4, what does he say? Let him that stole, steal no more, but rather let him do what? Labor with his hands. Now, what is good that he may have to give to those who are in need? I think what you have in these two verses here, remove falsehood and lies from me. Don't give me the temptation to believe whatever is told me. In fact, get those liars away from me. And then don't give me too much. Don't give me too little. Put me right here in the middle. Give me enough to be able to satisfy. And I think most of the time we tend to look at people and we say, I'm not as well off as somebody else. I'm not as well off as somebody else. If you've got food to eat, clothes to wear, and you're able to exist, what should you be? Thankful that that's what the Lord gave you and not more because if you got too much, it could ruin you. And I have seen many good people get too much and it ruined them, which makes it really good for us to pick up with verse 10 next Sunday morning. Thank you very much.